It's one of the biggest manhunts in the history of the CIA. Tracking down the engineer of the attacks of September the 11th. It was a scramble like you wouldn't believe to find this guy. You know, literally with like guns drawn on the street. It's like a true Wild West manhunt. In a deadly game of cat and mouse, the CIA will follow a chain of intelligence from the Philippines to the heart of Pakistan and attempt to capture Al-Qaeda's military mastermind, the man known as KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. CIA and Pakistani intelligence are closing in on one of the most wanted men in the world. Ten years earlier, he bombed the World Trade Center and in 2001 engineered the attacks of September the 11th. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was a master terrorist planner responsible for the greatest single-day loss of life in U.S. history since Pearl Harbor and was somebody who could you know, potentially inflict great harm on us again in future. We had to, to stop that from happening. This was every CIA operative, every FBI agent, every friendly government agent you could get looking for one guy. It's the biggest manhunt in history. The CIA has traced Muhammad's location to a house in northern Pakistan. Now, after years of close calls, the team has a chance to catch him. ISI officials in Pakistan and, and even people in the United States said that if we capture Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, we will break the back of the Al Qaeda network. One mistake, and the Al Qaeda mastermind will disappear to mount another attack. It's the do-or-die moment for a worldwide manhunt that begins years ago, thousands of kilometers away. December the 11th, 1994. Philippine Airlines Flight 434 has just taken off from Manila. The plane is full of mostly Japanese tourists and businessmen. But the passenger in seat 26K, Armaldo Forlani, is just now getting to work. Forlani is traveling under a fake passport. His real name is on the list of the FBI's most wanted, Ramzi Youssef. Ramzi Youssef was the guy who built the bomb and placed the bomb in the World Trade Center bombing in February of 1993. Ramzi Ahmed Youssef was close to being a genius with a gang of, of, of people who were none too bright. He came within an ace of knocking down the World Trade Center. Now, Yusuf is about to test drive another plot. Hidden in the lavatory, he pieces together a small bomb. Yusuf, who was an electrical engineer, had figured out how to build really small explosive devices that could be taken apart and taken onto an aircraft, bypassing the security. The nitroglycerin is put in contact lens solution bottles, and the watch is a watch. I mean, so none of this stuff appears dangerous. During the flight stopover on the island of Cebu, Yusuf gets off the plane. The bomb stays on board. Two hours later, en route to Tokyo, Seat 26K explodes. The blast rips a hole through the floor of the aircraft, tearing through to the luggage compartment below. 
The bomb went off over the Pacific, but it was a test. It was a small bomb. One person got killed, but the plane managed to, to land safely. The plane survived the explosion, but the test run was a success. The first step in a growing plot called Operation Bojinka. The Bojinka plot was a plot by Ramsey Youssef, KSM, and a couple of other guys out of Manila to plant bombs on 12 airliners and blow up those airliners heading to the United States from Asia, which could have killed about 4,000 people. They knew then that the bomb would work if placed in the right place and of sufficient size. The idea then, then is to take, you know, multiply the number of bombs, the number of planes, there you go. As the media reports news of the bombing, Yusuf reports back to his uncle, the head of the Manila terror cell, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, known at the CIA as KSM. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was sort of like a professional terrorist. I think his, his motivations seemed to be more, more about, like, essentially this was kind of fun to do these things. He's just always scheming and plotting to come up with a more spectacular terrorist incident. I don't think, he doesn't seem especially religious. Mohammed and his Manila terror cell may be engaged in a holy war, but they don't seem to be living a fundamentalist lifestyle. Manila's a destination for sex travel and for entertainment, and so it's got hundreds of bars and things that cater largely to foreigners. And that's where these guys, when they were in town, met with one another. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has always struck me as a man who has grown into Islam. Certainly when we first ran across Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, there was very little indication that he was a true believer. He was a bon vivant, he was a man about town, he was a womanizer. KSM is much more of a multi-dimensional character than most of the other jihadis that you come across. And KSM is different in the sense that he liked to have a good time while most of the other guys wouldn't be hanging out with beautiful women in the Philippines. But one of the mysteries of KSM is whether he really believed that or not, or if it was part of his cover uh, to infiltrate the West uh, in order to launch attacks against it. Whether jihadist or hedonist, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has avoided capture since he, along with Ramzi Youssef, masterminded the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was able to move around the world. And if you've seen pictures, he was very good at, at disguising himself. He was involved uh, to an extent with Al-Qaeda. And he was a going concern, as they used to say. He was a, a very much a, an active player against the United States. In a small apartment in downtown Manila, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Yusuf prepare to carry out their Borjinka plot to blow up several airliners. Yusuf oversees the construction of new, easily concealed explosives. Ramsey had gone to college for computer sciences in Britain and had learned through trial and error how to make bombs and electrical circuitry. Ramsey Yusuf had what we call trigger time. He was very good at building a car bomb, any sort of explosive. He was the bomb tech. On the 6th of January, 1995, one small mistake sets off a chain of events that will put the group back on the CIA's map. A chemical fire in the kitchen sink attracts the attention of the Manila police. The officers are unprepared for what they find inside. Like we went to the apartment to find this horrendous hoard of materials. 
It's a bomb factory. It takes actually two police vans to carry everything away. Yusuf's computer provides a wealth of information containing documents that outline the deadly details of the Bojinka plot. The documents also identify a partner in the terror cell, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He tried to determine then if this was the same Khalid Sheikh who had wired the money to Yusuf in New York for the World Trade Center building and they eventually determined that, yes, it was. A lot of the information from Manila helped lay the groundwork for the indictment of KSM and, and ultimately to figure out what he was doing with Al-Qaeda and, and, and his place in the network. The CIA now has proof that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was behind the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, but he and Yusuf have disappeared. A stream of chatter puts Yusuf in Pakistan, but no one knows where until a bounty of $2 million proves too much for one man to resist. A South African Muslim walked into the U.S. Embassy and said, I know where he is and I want the reward. Now the CIA and Pakistani intelligence have a chance to capture a sworn enemy of the United States. Open the door! Seventh of February, 1995. The CIA has tracked Ramzi Yusuf, the engineer of the World Trade Center bombing, to a guest house in Islamabad, Pakistan. The FBI and their partners at Pakistani intelligence get ready to surprise him with a visit. Embassy personnel tell me they really do believe they've located Ramsey Yusuf. So with State Department agents and DEA agents, we go to a guest house in Islamabad called the Sukhasa Guest House. Open the door. Run this up, open the door. One, two, three, go. Security teams raid the guest house and quickly capture their target. They go in this room and take a gentleman into custody. And it's a custom for whatever reason in Pakistan where you basically uh, put blindfolds over the person you're arrested, I guess, so they can't see you or, or anyone else. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is still at large, but catching Ramzi Yusuf marks a pivotal moment in the manhunt. Getting him to talk first falls to the FBI's Brad Garrett. Garrett uses a simple technique to win a suspect's trust. When he blinks, a contact tumbles out of his eye and lands on his shirt. Now, they have his hands shackled down, so he can't move his hands. So I look at him, and I look at the contact, and I said, do you want me to take care of that? And he paused for a minute, and he said, yes. So I take his contact, put it in the cup of water, and, and place it where he can see it. And so that's how we started uh, our, our initial contact with each other. Ramsey proves to be a calm captive, well-spoken, cooperative, and ready to talk. I said, were you involved in blowing up the World Trade Center in February of 1993? He smiled and he said, well, I masterminded blowing up the World Trade Center. Uh, I said, okay, how about telling me about that? Yusuf describes how he was sent to the United States to scout out buildings to attack and settled on the World Trade Center as the best symbolic target. He says their goal had been to kill a quarter of a million people, but he was rushed by his bosses and wasn't able to build the bomb he wanted. He said, you have to understand that this is not personal. I'm enjoying talking to you. He says, I don't have anything against you. 
what I'm opposed to and my group is opposed to are U.S. policies with Israel. And he said, you know, the Israelis are killing Palestinians and other people of the Muslim faith, and it's not right. And we believe if we inflict enough damage on you, you'll change your policies. So that was his mindset. Not crazy, articulate, knew what he wanted to do, had had a plan, and like a good soldier, he carried it out. Yusuf provides valuable insight, but one thing he won't discuss is his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. After Ramzi Yusuf's capture, intelligence pours in that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has fled to Afghanistan to meet with Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. In Afghanistan's outback, Mohammed sees the scale of Al-Qaeda's terror training. Bomb building, target practice, agility. With bin Laden's help, he begins to hatch a new plan, the next phase of their attacks on the US. The way I've seen from the most authoritative records is that KSM says, I got an idea. I mean, it's, it's like almost like college kids on the weekend, like pulling a prank for Saturday night that you don't, everything's gonna happen. And bin Laden says, yeah, go do it. Bin Laden extends an offer to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to join Al-Qaeda and to swear allegiance to the group. But Mohammed refuses. For Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, no one else shares his extreme dedication to holy war against the United States. But bin Laden is about to prove him wrong. Seventh of August, 1998. Explosions create shockwaves over the capitals of Kenya and Tanzania as suicide bombers destroy two U.S. embassies. The gruesome attacks mark a new salvo in the holy war led by Osama bin Laden and firmly put his Al-Qaeda terrorist organization on the map. The embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania convinced the FBI and the CIA that bin Laden had very, very deadly intentions and was capable uh, of and interested in killing Americans uh, wherever he could find them. It was very clear that Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda were a threat to the United States greater than any other terrorist group we had ever seen. The numbers involved, the resources they commanded, and the geographical reach they had was something we had not seen before. The Africa bombings also catch the attention of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and inspire him to officially join the ranks of bin Laden's al-Qaeda. Still on the run from the CIA, Sheikh Mohammed returns to Afghanistan to work with bin Laden on their plot for a second World Trade Center attack, this time using not bombs, but commercial airliners. Within two years, their hand-picked soldiers are in flight schools in the United States and on what they call the Holy Tuesday operation, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed dispatches the 19 hijackers to make history. If you looked at bin Laden as the architect of Al-Qaeda, sort of building the structure of it, KSM is almost the engineer who actually, you know, builds the structures and gets things done. And KSM at every step basically you know, pushed bin Laden away and, and seized control of the plot and made sure that's, you know, that, that everything happened according to plan. The attacks of 9-11 catch an entire nation off guard and prove that Al-Qaeda's reach extends to U.S. soil. It also changes Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's status from terrorist threat to leader of a deadly international holy war. Yeah, the central question is how does, how does anybody become a mass murderer? 
How does anybody become a terrorist? How did Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who came from a fairly ordinary background, end up being you know, the mastermind of the greatest terrorist attack in history? It's incredibly frustrating. There have been people in the FBI and the CIA that said that if they had caught KSM in the mid-90s when they had a chance, none of this might have happened. And it remains to be seen whether somebody else could have filled his shoes. But, you know, there's a lot of people that think that they couldn't, that it was his force of personality that carried through the 9-11 plot. Six days after the attack, President George Bush approves a new CIA war plan. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. Worldwide attack matrix and signs an executive order authorizing the CIA to pour millions of dollars into intelligence services. The plan loosens restrictions on covert operations, permitting assassinations, break-ins, psychological warfare, and enhanced interrogation. It also creates a new military role for the CIA, and within days, advanced teams are on the ground in Afghanistan laying the groundwork for war. CIA advanced teams infiltrate Afghanistan to build alliances with the local resistance and gather intelligence on Taliban targets. In November of 2001, CIA Predator drones patrol the skies over Afghanistan. People running to the west. Cancel, please. More uh, movers, uh, another vehicle, and uh, more people cleared to engage all those. Uh, Roger that. A series of airstrikes destroy multiple Taliban hideouts, killing over 3,000 people, including Al-Qaeda's military commander, Mohammed Atef. In the aftermath, investigators uncover scores of documents and videotapes containing plans for new terrorist attacks. CIA analysts also find what they're looking for, communication between Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the man who was to be the 20th hijacker in the 9-11 plot, Ramzi bin al-Shiba. The first time I heard of Ramzi bin al-Shiba was after 9-11. He apparently was a go-between between the Germany-based 9-11 attackers and, and al-Qaeda in, uh, in uh, South Asia. He became the communications channel through which all this information was relayed. Ben Sheba became his sort of second in command on the plot. Al Sheba's web of contacts is a virtual hit list of targets for the CIA. Each one putting them another step closer to catching the man behind the 9-11 attacks, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Twenty-eighth of March, two thousand and two, in the city of Faisalabad, the CIA and Pakistani intelligence forces are on the hunt for the man behind the attacks of 9/11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. They're targeting all of his known associates, and the chase brings them to the home of an Al Qaeda operative named Abu Zubaydah. Abu Zubaydah he was severely wounded in, during the capture and was they were fearful that he would die. And the first task was to keep him alive, and the second was to interrogate him. 
Zubeda is secretly transferred from one black site to another and endures so-called enhanced interrogation, what many would consider torture. The value of the information he gives will remain highly disputed for years to come. But he does divulge the identity of one of the key planners of the September 11th attacks, a mysterious figure the CIA knows only as Mukhtar. The CIA had known for a long time that a guy named Mukhtar was somehow involved in Al-Qaeda and was repeatedly mentioning a connection with the planes operation with the 9-11 attacks. They didn't know who it was. And when they showed Zubeda the photograph of KSM, he says, that's Mukhtar. They went, what? He says, yeah, that's, that's Mukhtar. Mukhtar means the brain in, in Urdu. Um, and they had been hearing about um, Mukhtar as being an instrumental force in the 9-11 attacks. And so when they realized that KSM was Mukhtar, it was sort of a holy smokes moment, for lack of a better word, where they said, oh my god, the guy that we've been chasing since 96 or 95 is actually the same guy that pulled off 9-11. Zubeda's confessions reveal that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has emerged as Al-Qaeda's senior military leader and confirmed that KSM was the chief architect of the attacks of 9-11. The main reason for a focus on KSM was not so much because of what he'd done in the past, but what we feared he might be doing in the future. That was the burden that we all carried. They're gonna hit us again. We've gotta uncover it. We've gotta stop it. We, we simply can't allow this to happen again. It was um, a scramble like you wouldn't believe to find this guy and, and no stone was unturned and no, you know, you know, all the stops were pulled out to, to find him. I mean, we're talking everything from retasking satellites uh, to gather intercepts, to putting people on the ground, troops, FBI agents, CIA agents, sending cables to embassies around the world saying, have you seen this guy? But in the shadowy world of terrorism, gaining access to either Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or Al-Qaeda contacts is nearly impossible. Sometimes it all comes down to a lucky break. Spring 2002, Al Jazeera journalist Yosri Fuda has made the risky trip to Pakistan to score a high-level interview. But with whom, he doesn't know. driven to a secret location in downtown Karachi. This must have seemed a foolish thing to do because Fuda didn't even know who he was going to meet, but he had been, he'd been asked to come and he went. And when he shows up, he recognizes them immediately. Fuda finds himself seated in front of Al-Qaeda Lieutenant Ramzi bin al-Shiba and the mastermind of September the 11th himself, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. One of the most remarkable things that happens after 9-11 is that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed consents to a television interview describing his role in the plot. The most wanted man in the world and what's he do? He calls up a reporter, says, let's sit down and chat. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Al Shiba describe how they planned the attacks, from studying flight timetables to training pilots to selecting targets for maximum impact. KSM said in his interview that the attack themselves was to rub our face in what they say they felt for the past hundred years, either at the hands of the United States or the Israelis 
or the Indians, that it was time the Americans should be humiliated and, and embarrassed by someone attacking them instead of always the other way around. Look, the, the A-team of terrorism don't talk to the press ever, 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 don't even say anything. I mean, the fact that this guy was so eager to claim 9-11 and go to Al Jazeera, food I was working for, is, is just like nutty. To me, that probably was not an interview that was sanctioned by al-Qaeda. To me, that was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed as the swashbuckler, as the man who didn't think there was a bullet made for him, who wanted to advertise what he had done. According to Fuda, the Al-Qaeda duo refused to let him take the video of the interview, but they do let him keep an audio recording. The National Security Administration gets hold of the audio and feeds it into a computerized signals monitoring system codenamed Echelon. Before long, the system locks on to a familiar voice when one Al-Qaeda operative makes a costly mistake. On the roof of the Karachi safe house, Ramzi Al-Shiba makes a call using a traceable satellite phone. Hello, Sheikh Mohammed. I was living in Karachi on, on and off. It's one of the world's largest cities. It's a great place to disappear. It's mostly huge chunks of the city are no-go areas for the police. It's a good place to function if you're one of these Al-Qaeda leaders. And so they went to the cities thinking that that would provide them anonymity. The NSA surveillance program picks up the signal and identifies the voice as al Shiba and pinpoints his location. The US sends the details to Pakistani intelligence. Two men emerge from the Al-Qaeda safe house to grab a quick morning meal. It's an opportunity for the ISI surveillance teams to make their move. <laughs> Noise from the scuffle alerts the Al-Qaeda fighters inside, and they quickly prepare for an all-out war. SI agents move into the house. An Al-Qaeda fighter hits back with a grenade. The Pakistanis, when they do an operation like this, they've got local police, state police, federal police, intelligence guys, the army and before it was done there were thousands of shots fired at the building the building was just i mean this it was just completely shellac the press would later report that 2000 troops are eventually called in to quell the battle in all Pakistani forces capture five Al-Qaeda members, including a major target, Ramzi bin Al-Shiba. They also round up two young boys, the sons of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Two of his children were captured that same day and were taken into Pakistani custody and, and interrogated. And in fact, Pakistani intel people think that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was there in Karachi with Bin Sheba and got away. The ISI at the time told me that it was almost like one of those Western films where you get to the campfire and, you know, the, the embers are still smoking and there's a hot cup of coffee there and, you know, they just missed him. I mean, that's, that's the way they described it, that he was literally always one step ahead of them. Once again, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed manages to slip away but his sons are disclosing valuable details about their father's operations. But before the CIA can locate their ultimate target, KSM and his Al-Qaeda forces hit back hard. Oh, 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 oh. 
in Yemen, a small boat loaded with explosives slams into a French oil tanker. A week later, on the tropical island of Bali, coordinated bombs explode at packed tourist nightclubs, killing more than 200 people. It's the worst terrorist attack since 9-11. And Al-Qaeda shows no signs of letting up. The timing of the attacks suggests the handiwork of Al-Qaeda's chief planner, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Throughout the autumn of 2002, the CIA coordinates a massive surveillance dragnet to find Khalid Sheikh Mohammed using mobile phone intercepts and informants on the ground. The U.S. electronic eavesdropping is able to get not Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, but other figures talking about what was being planned. Finally, they get enough electronic intelligence to narrow down where he might be. The CIA picks up phone traffic that points to Pakistan's border with Afghanistan. An informant identifies an Al-Qaeda safe house in the frontier town of Quetta. In the dead of night, Pakistani forces storm the house. They round up a handful of men. But once again, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed seems to have vanished. A search of the house turns up a huge amount of intelligence, names, phone numbers, and email addresses. But it's something else that leads security forces to the ultimate target. First of March 2003, a year and a half after 9-11, Pakistani security forces and the CIA are closing in on the mastermind of the attacks. A text message from an informant places Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in a house in Rawalpindi, Pakistan. Once they have him located in Rawalpindi, and after having followed him for a little while, the CIA grows increasingly nervous that he's going to get away again. So they're the ones who press the Pakistanis that we have to go get him and go get him now. At 3 a.m., 18 ISI officers and a few CIA agents close in on the target. They quickly overpower a security guard and break into the house. Firefight, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed shoots an army colonel. But eventually, the officers overpower him. He clearly thought he had immunity in Pakistan. And he was in Raul Pindi because he probably thought he was going to continue to be operational. He was going to continue the, the war, the, 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 the war on the West. And, you know, he didn't know that he had passed his time. It was over. The Pakistanis arrest Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and round up two other men, the owner of the house and an al-Qaeda financier. The family claims they held at gunpoint while officers ransacked the house. They confiscate a massive amount of evidence. Computer disks and drives. The most important thing when you capture someone is to grab either his papers or his electronic media, because they never expected the Americans to read that. I mean, if it wasn't for the tools of the modern world, we probably wouldn't have him in custody. Uh, we wouldn't know who he was. Uh, so it, it, it's a double-edged sword for 
the would-be jihadis. You know, you leave tracks that you can't erase uh, in the modern world, and eventually someone's able to track them down, uh, to follow them to, to the person. And by all accounts, that's how Khalid Sheikh got captured. Over a year after the attacks of 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is finally in custody. This was the biggest law enforcement man out in history. This was every CIA operative, every FBI agent, every friendly government agent you could get looking for one guy. And it still took him a year. And it's astonishing. But this is just the official story. In the Hall of Mirrors of Pakistani espionage, the most challenging hunt of all is the search for the truth. The family in Rawalpindi claims KSM was nowhere near their home, and the Pakistani forces simply looted the house, taking whatever they could find. They claim the soldiers fired their guns, but there was no battle. Other reports state Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was captured in the raid in Quetta two months earlier and held for questioning by Pakistani security before being handed over to the CIA. Every event that happens in Pakistan has eight versions of how it happened, why it happened, who did it, who was seen, who wasn't seen, what was heard. Some say Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was in the Karachi safe house during the showdown with Pakistani intelligence. According to this version of events, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was captured along with his sons and Ramzi bin Shiva. There are people I know who swore that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was killed that day. Whatever the truth, the Pakistanis turn Khalid Sheikh Mohammed over to the CIA. He confesses to involvement in at least 30 terrorist plots, including Bojinka, 9-11, and the beheading of American journalist Daniel Pearl. Many of these revelations are extracted during so-called enhanced interrogations, when KSM was waterboarded 183 times. You look at the results of, of the interrogation of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and we now know it was done under you know, torture. I mean, there's no other way to call water waterboarding. That's the definition. And, and, and testimony from torture is not reliable. It's just not reliable. Most of these men who are knowledgeable about future attacks or plans or intentions against U.S. interests have been trained to withstand interrogation. I don't see any way that we can avoid enhanced interrogations, as you say, because otherwise they're not going to say anything. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is now in US custody, awaiting trial in Guantanamo Bay. The names and critical intelligence he has provided are now helping the CIA continue its mission, as agents across the world work around the clock to catch the next Khalid Sheikh Mohammed before he can attack. Well, there were some people that said after KSM was captured, there probably wouldn't be another 9-11 plot. And I think the fact that there hasn't been one for 10 years is sort of a testament to the fact that KSM was a sort of a one in a million guy and was able to really pull something like this off. Part of the, the task of, of the CIA has been to make it as difficult as possible for the terrorists to operate. If you are constantly looking over your shoulder, constantly having to move, constantly trying to stymie efforts to, uh, to determine your location, uh, you're going to have far less time to, uh, to devote to terrorism. There really is nobody else who can do it as well as, uh, as the CIA.
Don't miss Warrior Graveyard, a brand new series on the archaeology of warfare, starting tomorrow at 8. Stay tuned for The Great Fire of London, The Untold Story. Thank you.